the stargazing last night. The rest of you missed what is going to be one of the highlights of the trip for me. We had beautiful skies, the, the ship's lights were turned out, and it was just wonderful. I, I've seen the sun the skies many times. I've never tired of seeing you know, all the wonderful things. So Steve is going to give us a sort of uh, a user's guide to the night sky, followed by Dr. Mike Reynolds, who's going to give us some tips on how to photograph that eclipse. And uh, and so I'm going to bring to this to the podium again Steve O'Meara, who I, I mentioned last time I have known Steve a very long time, but he is renowned for his very keen eyesight, although I noticed that he's using reading glasses these days. And uh, Steve's, uh, among his many visual claims to fame, he was the first person to visually confirm the return of Halley's Comet in 1985, where he went to the top of Mauna Kea, which some of you were, were there with us, uh, took, uh, was it was the 88 inch, was it? No, it was the 24 inch. 24 inch. Uh, with a team of scientists confirming he was breathing oxygen, <laughs> trying to, to make sure that his like pupils were clear, and he definitely saw it. It was, it was great. He probably got the best view of how he's come with that entire apparition. So otherwise, kind of one. <laughs> anyway, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Stephen. Thank Merrill. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, uh, anyone who wants to talk about the southern skies, I'll be available at lunch tomorrow at noon. I'll go up to the Ocean Cafe, and if you want to join me, we can sit down and talk. Because I'm sure some of you have some of your favorite objects that you're curious about you might want to see. And also, yeah, Deborah Carter from uh, uh, Travel Quest Trip Manager, um, who studies yoga, and I really like this, and I want you to all try this. Because it's, it's going to be worth it. We're heading down, we've been traveling now for a week, we still have a little bit to go until we get to the eclipse site, where we want calm seas, clear skies. So the whole idea is just to keep that in your mind at all times, right? Calm seas, clear skies. Now, let me hear it. Calm On the seas, seas clear skies. skies. Now, look at each other and say it. <laughs> clear sky all right you need, we need it and to share this with others you know because if we get the whole ship going calm seas clear skies guess what we're just going to sail right into the commerce oceans and have the clearest skies and the best eclipse possible so i hope you are uh can join in on that that experience now speaking of sailing and voyaging and we've been doing this for a long time, uh, going off on the well, that's a ship that's traveling at. Sebastian, how, how fast are we going? 17, 20, about basically 20. Okay, hey, right. Okay, 18 knots, almost 20 miles an hour. Now think of this. We're sailing right now, right through the Polynesian Triangle. And the Polynesians, with, and specifically the Hawaiians, where we came from, we're heading toward their homeland, which was Tahiti. We're not going to Tahiti, but we're heading toward, we're still in the Polynesian Triangle, where the Polynesians lived and on various islands. Now, they were great navigators, and just imagine in a canoe that was probably about the size of this front row of chairs. They sailed across this vast ocean from Tahiti to Hawaii, using the stars as their guides. Now guess which one of their stars was one of the most important? Okay, Southern Cross was very, was very important. Sirius was important. Arcturus was absolutely important. Very, very, very important. But what about the North Star? Yes, they did. They, now, I want you to think about that. So the Hawaiians knew about the North Star. How could they use, it was called ki, ki, oh, I'm sorry, ki, oh, pa, ki, oh, pa, the everlasting one, the unmoving. 
And they had it. Now, the, the Hawaiians did not write down the names of the stars. They didn't, they, they didn't scribble it down. They only had basic chiefs and priests who could interpret the sky, and they were the ones that told the navigators what to do. And so here was this magic star, Kiopaa. How did they know about that? Hawaii is north of the equator. You can see it from there. The Hawaiians looked at the equator, and you can see it from there. Very close and very good. <laughs> the Hawaiians, based on all types of entomology, uh, ad, ad dating, the wood, tattoo dating, traveling, they actually lived in China, where they knew the net, they knew Kiopaa. And what happened was, in the whichever dynasty, it might have been the Ming dynasty, there was a ripple effect where the, as the dynasty grew, the Polynesians were pushed coastal. Once they were on the coast, they set in their, in their canoes, and they set sail for what was then Formosa, which is Taiwan. Then they walked down to Taiwan, and then they were pushed out of Taiwan and went across and populated the Micronesian Islands. From there, one band went south to New Zealand. The other ones went uh, east to Tahiti. And then from there, they were able to sail north, knowing that once they crossed the equator, they were able to use the North Star as their guide. Now, and thank you, the person who says, said Arcturus is very important. How many of you know Arcturus? Raise your hand. Some of you, some of you know. Really bright star, yellowish appearing. It's in the constellation Bootes, the herdsman. Now, here's what's real. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm glad Kelly just returned. Because I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think you know this story, Kelly. But see, when I was in the offices at Sky and Telescope, I received a phone call. But the funny thing was, it was after hours. And I was closing up, and you weren't there. No one was there. And I just saw the red light blinking on the phone. And it meant a call was coming in. And I knew that, and I was contemplating. Huh, should I pick it up? Well, I decided I would, so I picked it up, and I heard something really soft, really, really soft. And I thought immediately, oh, prank call, I shouldn't have picked the phone up, but I was about to hang up when I heard sort of like a gasp of the man said, hello. I went, hello? And he said, can you help me? I, I said, I, I, I'll try. Is it something you'd like to know? And he says, there's a star on my window. And I've always known. I always like that star. And if you tell me its name, I'm dying. I thought I was hope. I said, and I immediately knew which star it was. And I just said, uh, it, it, I said, is it really bright yellow? And he says, yes. And I said, I'll be, I'll be right back. So I said, I, I, Dashed down the stairs, you know, dashed down the stairs, and I went outside. I had to make sure. And I got back, I looked up, and I came in, uh, back to the phone, and I said, Sir, the star's name is Arcturus. And I said, To the Hawaiian, it's the star of Hopalea. It means the star of gladness. It's the star that brings the warriors home. He said, thank you, and then he just, it was a gasp, and he hung up. And I, I just thought, so here's someone who lived the entire life. Just seeing and not knowing. Having a companion and not knowing. A companion saying, you yeah. know. That's why it's important, I think, just like we know the name of a flower, or we know bird, even if you pick out one star that you really, really like, have it as a companion. I have my own. Sirius is my companion. I'll share that with you. It's like every time I either get off a plane or anything, it's like, there's Sirius. I get off the ship <laughs> to go out stargazing, open the door. It's like, there's Sirius. So I, I always like Sirius as my companion. So I did that for two reasons. One is to show you that 
we learn the Greek legends and about the stars and, and so on, the mythologies, but I just want you to be aware, and we can talk about this at lunch. All different cultures, all different cultures, have their own names and patterns for the stars. And I'll give you just one, one other example, because you, you, you will all see it uh, the next clear night. And many of you saw these last night. The Hawaiians had, and the Polynesians overall, had a very large foraging canoe. That was one of their most important constellations, not surprisingly. It was called Tama Rera Ra. And it was a large canoe. And the Pleiades, the Pleiades, was the bow of the ship. Orion's belt, the three stars, was the stern. Taurus, the bull, the V, was the sail. And way down the Milky Way was its anchor, which was the Southern Cross, with Alpha and Beta Centauri as the chain. It's an enormous constellation that took up almost an entire segment of the Milky Way, like two-thirds of the Milky Way from that. And of course, the ship is sailing down the river Milky Way. Everyone looked at the Milky Way as this river of stars. Except, of course, a lot of, a lot of Aborigines looked upon the stars as their ancestors. And whenever the stars rose, it was a time of celebration. Can you just imagine this? Just imagine this. Their soul, the souls of their ancestors were in the sky as stars. That's how intimate they were. So the stars set. It was a great time of sadness because they're not going to see their ancestor again until they came back or she came back. So it's, there is an intimate relationship between us and the sky. Now, what I'm going to do now is uh, give you a more, I just really wanted you to understand that more emotional aspect of the historical side that I don't have all day, so I have to go into. What I want to show you is some, uh, a, a few select objects that are of great importance in the southern sky with some interesting concepts that are important as guide stars to these objects. Just so when we're out and Kelly has his telescope, we can look at them. But the thing is, if I were just to show you what you would see through a binoculars or a telescope, you can all imagine it right now. Think of a small white blob. Okay? Sometimes they have stars in it. Right? Essentially, that's what almost everything we look at. But that's only part of the experience. Seeing that and understanding what you are seeing is the other half. Half of astronomy is visualization and understanding what you're looking at. You're seeing something so far away and so faint, you're going to be unimpressed, perhaps, with the visual view. But if you use your mind and say, my word, this is 8 million light years away. Light traveling through space, 8 million years, light years. You know. 186,000 miles per second times 8 million. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty impressive. Okay. So the short history of the southern sky, the first thing is, unlike in the northern sky, where we have lots of mythological features like Pegasus, the winged horse, and all comes out of Greek mythology, and Perseus, the hero, saves Andromeda, and all that, in the southern sky, we really have things that were found during the age of southern sea exploration. So we, we find they have Apis, the bird of paradise. You have the chameleon. You have uh, volans, the flying fish. Have you seen the flying fish? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's what it's named for. They're sailing in their ships and they see those little flesh, fish flying. Um, Dorado, the swordfish. There's a sea snake, Tucan, Tucana. They have a phoenix rising out of the flames. This is Bruce the crane. This is the peacock. Telescopium, which is one of the telescopes that uh, uh, you will just see him in a second. The Kaye used to uh, survey the sky. So there, there's lots of no mythology, just a lot of uh, 
either instruments and implementation or of animals that they had found. Now, one of the first explorers, telescopic explorers of the night sky, was Edmund Halley. Soon after he graduated from college in uh, uh, 1677, he took a sail down to the southern island of St. Helena. And he went aboard a British uh, uh, naval vessel. And this was, of course, the most southern uh, land mass owned by the United Kingdom, which is why he went there. So he, and it, he, he had, was doing a lot of meteorological observations and other observations, but he was mainly there to catalog stars. And here is St. Helena, and he was positioned himself high up on this hill. To this day, it is called Halley's Hill. Interestingly enough, Halley's Hill is right by Napoleon's grave. Remember, you? Remember Napoleon was exiled to St. Helena. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but you know, I, I have a relative, a distant, distant relative. His name is Barry O'Meara, and he, he was Napoleon's doctor. And so, <laughs> but that explains all now. He, 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 was, he, was, he was told that, you know, basically he was putting arsenic in Napoleon's tea. But, so, I mean, all I can say is, just don't ask me to get you any tea. <laughs> so, anyway, um, while, I'm sorry, I have to go back. See. Uh, but while on St. Helena, Halley was actually clouded out most of the time. But guess what he, uh, he discovered? Who knows? One of the most famous that he discovered, Omega Centauri. Yeah, he, found, he, he discovered Omega Centauri, and he found some other northern uh, clusters like M13 and M11. But for the south of the sky, the discoverer of, uh, of Omega Centauri, great globular cluster, 10 million stars in it, was, was uh, Edmund Halley. And when Halley returned, he was followed by Nicholas Louise de Lacaille. And Lacaille set out, he made a number of constellations, new constellations, uh, Microscopium and Anthea and uh, Felis the cat. <laughs> you remember the cartoon Felix the cat? All right, it's based on Felix the cat. Now, Felix the cat, of course, isn't one of the uh, acknowledged ABA constellations, but that's okay. I still like it. And, but more importantly, Lacaille was, uh, he made the first telescopic survey of the sky uh, in clear weather. And he discovered a number of objects and categorized them. And, um, well, of course, among the constellations that he created was this, called Octans. And you see right here, next to Octans, is Sigma Octantis. You know what that is? That's a southern star. It's a magnitude 5.6 star, which means basically you need either good eyesight from the ship or you need binoculars to see. However, I'm going to tilt this. I'm going to tilt this over and see. Uh, it's kind, this is kind of how we're looking at the sky. If you remember, if the best here's a large Magellanic cloud in Canopus. If you draw a straight line through them, here's a small Magellanic cloud. Remember I told you it was right above the star? Well, look at it. Octantis is right here. Octantis is right here. And then Sigma is, is about, not midway, but we can find it. It's, it's, it's a binocular star. But it's up when we go out observing. Right. Uh, um, but among the objects that Lacaille found, and of course, this looked nothing like what he was seeing through his telescope, are some of the objects we really admire. NGC 2070, the Tarantula Nebula, 47 Tucani, the beautiful globular cluster right next to uh, uh, the Small Magellanic Cloud, the cluster NGC 2477 in Puppis, this is another beautiful cluster in Carina, the Jewel Box, which is visible later um, in Crooks. And of course, some of you may not even know it, but M83, which ended up in Messier's catalog. Messier was aware of Lacaille. In fact, a lot of people that I don't think that Messier only made a catalog of his discoveries, but he only found about 50% of objects in them. The first thing he did was scour all the known discoveries, put them into his catalog, and then he added his own, and then topped with others, like Machine, who were um, who came later. 
But now the next, and the final uh, little bit of history I'm going to give you on this part is Thomas Brisbane formed an observatory at Parramatta in New South Wales. And he hired James Dunlop uh, to run the observatory and also to go out and make a new discovery with a larger telescope, which I had limited time. He made a lot of discoveries. But James Dunlop set out and he made a, he made a catalog of 629 new objects that were unfortunately, no, wait, that were unfortunately, <laughs> the reason uh, you know here much about James Dunlop is because John Herschel went down to the Cape and he set out to survey the skies and made a wonderful catalog of 1,700 objects. Then he went over and looked at Dunlop's catalog and he couldn't find two thirds of the objects. So he came back and he basically said, the catalog is almost essentially worthless and Dunlop was forgotten. But unfortunately, that one third of the catalog was really beautiful and includes such objects as MGC uh, Galaxy uh, uh, 55, this beautiful uh, globular cluster that's in the small Magellanic Cloud. I mean, look, at this, look at this galaxy in the reticulum. I showed you some reticulum last night. This is a Wolf Rayette nebula. He even found dark nebulae in Corona uh, Australis. And of course, he also found Centaurus A. So he was really a, an excellent observer. He was called the Messiah of the Southern Sky. So now, some of you saw this uh, last night. This is Fomalhaut, and this is the constellation Pisces Austrinus. This is the head of the fish, the southern fish, and here's his tail. Right, that kind of looks makes sense. And here's Bruce, the crane. And there's a nice series of multiple stars along the neck of the crane with a beautiful triple star up at the top of the head. Now, I just want to show you this. <laughs> Take a look at the crane. Now, look at the fish. Kind of a hideous looking thing, isn't it? You think that's bad? So it even got worse. In 16, that was in 1690. This is in. 1801, look at this thing. What does that tell you? You see, they knew nothing about the ocean. They had no idea what things were. They just saw bits and pieces of different fish and they threw them together in fanciful ways and that's how they imagined things. And so that's why when you look out sometimes into the night sky and, we, and I show you a constellation, or Kelly shows you a light, and you say, God, that doesn't look like anything. And you just have to go, oh, no, you have to see the real thing, <laughs> such as this. OK. So now let's take a look at something very interesting. I, I hope you take a look at Fomalhaut, because Fomalhaut has a planet. Fomalhaut has a, uh, a planet the size of Jupiter, uh, about 100 times more massive uh, than the Earth. And you have uh, it orbiting right here, and look at this, a huge dust ring. Here's an artist's impression of what's going on in this jovian sized planet orbiting this stuff. And this is a real direct photograph of the actual motion of the planet. So, how many of you attended Kelly's talk? Okay. <laughs> did, did you see where I'm getting it? <laughs> Notice I keep saying planet. Right? And the planet is in this dust ring, and the planet is in this big debris field. But the IAU says anything that is not, hasn't wiped its orbit clean of debris is not a planet. So Pluto's not a planet because it hasn't wiped its orbit clean. I think it's done a pretty good job myself. But here, look at this debris. And whenever we look to another star, it's okay. They're planets. I don't know. Thanks, Rose. So here we have Fomalhaut. Okay, Drus is going down. This is a, not for this horizon, but just take a look. This is Pisces, Austrinus with Fomalhaut. And there's a nice little constellation called Sculptor. And this is Difta, which is a tail of, of Cetus, the sea monster. And these, and right here, is, this is actually the South Galactic Pole. That is where our galaxy, where its southern axis is pointing in the sky. And right above it, right above that point, so right between, this is like beta, CD, and alpha, 
skeleton. There's a fantastic object called NGC 253. You can see this, you can see it in telescopes. It's not a difficult object at all. It's just below naked eye visibility. But it's a, a fantastic um, uh, galaxy about the size of the Milky Way, seen almost edge on, with a brilliant center and just intricate and feathery dust lights. Now, this is the Hubble Space Telescope of, this, of the same image, and it is absolutely spectacular. They believe what's happening in this region, this is just a region that about 2,000 light years across inside this galaxy. And right in here, encircling this, is a ring of star formation. All the blue stars that you see are a new stars being formed. It's called a starburst galaxy. Something is going on that's creating this, this uh, fantastic and violent rate of star formation in the galaxy. And what's happening is close to the nucleus and somewhere, they think that once every five years, a supernova explodes. Once every five years. So that's like almost once every 30 years we get a supernova explosion in our galaxy. And they think that the supernova explosion powering through all this dust is actually creating uh, the, the new formation. And if you look up to the edge of the galaxy, these are all individu individual stars. Look down here. There's another galaxy with a little companion next to it. And NGC 253 has a companion in the same field of view. If you can get a one degree field of view, you can see NGC 288, which is a beautiful, this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of the core of this globular star cluster, which it's a very loose star cluster, so it probably you know, has about you know, maybe, maybe 50,000 stars in it. And all these uh, yellow stars are giant, the, green, the greenish color ones are super massive. And if you can see, this isn't a very good resolution, but if you can see little orange specks in there, you're looking at actually galaxies through the cluster. You're looking through the cluster, beyond it, way off into the uh, distance. And that's, but this is about 30,000 light years away. And then beyond it, right through that gap, you're seeing galaxies that are a uh, few uh, millions of light years away. So what we're interested in right now is Arcanar and uh, So that can open in Arcanar. And then if you look in between for Tucane, this is this small Magellanic cloud, Hydrus, little, little triangle of stars, and then the large Magellanic cloud. So we looked at these yesterday, but the most important part in order to find the small Magellanic cloud is to find Arcanar and then look at this triangle. And the small Magellanic cloud is way down toward this edge of the triangle. This is how it's oriented in the sky when you go up on the deck. Now, Arcanar itself, I told you to start with Arcanar, is a fantastic star because it's at the end of the river Arandanus in Greek mythology. And that here is uh, the normal star, but it's actually an oblate spheroid, and it's rotating so fast at 253 kilometers per second that it's twice as fat as it is uh, tall. And here's a number of clusters within, and we can, and I, I'm just going to show this to you, but when you look in your telescopes at the small Magellanic cloud, you really want to concentrate in this part of the pork chop, that little rib-like section. This is the meat section. This is a little handle. But you have uh, several nebulae that are especially bright in that section of the small Magellanic cloud. And of course, 47 Tucane, which has been called the Eye of God. It just has an incredibly dense, compact center. Millions of suns packed inside a, a small area of sky, tens of thousands of light years away. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image of the core, 
you can see how much more populated it is than the other one. And they found about 100 x-ray sources in the center of the core. And then I'm just going to move on to, uh, and some of you saw this. This is the southern Pleiades. It's called Theta Carina. And it's just, uh, uh, well, I didn't have a, the map beforehand that was just not good enough to show on the screen. So, but we saw, how many of you saw the southern Pleiades last night? Yeah, several. It's, it's visible with the naked eye. It's, it's. You saw the Northern Pleiades as well, that's right. And this sort of gives you an overall idea, again, on how to find your way. So here's Orion and Canopus, um, uh, uh, sorry, Sirius, the little dog, Puppus, and Canopus. So these two, the two brightest stars in the sky, and again, they point directly to um, the large Magellanic cloud. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay, it's also upside down, but that's okay. That's that's how we're seeing it in the sky. With 47 Tucane, this is the small Magellanic cloud. This is the large Magellanic cloud, and this little knot right here is the uh, tarantula nebula. And just for your imagination, the Milky Way is in the title. Uh, it is being affected by the two two companions in, in their creating a tidal stream as they're more or less the gravity is tearing apart each other and they're taking material off into long tidal tails. And just a number of objects that are visible, again, uh, I'm not expecting you to see all this, but they, if you look through the spine of the Large Magellanic Cloud, this is the uh, uh, tarantula nebula, but there are a number of bright objects that can be seen in the small telescope. And the tarantula nebula itself. A little more, a little more close up. And then this is called the uh, seahorse, 20 light years apart. Now, in, in this section in the tarantula nebula, this is where we have ongoing star formation. So right in here, you're not going to see this thing in your uh, in the telescopes, but this is part of it for your imagination. All of this dark cloud, they are hovering inside proto stars that will be born, and the heat and radiation from nearby stars is, is pushing all this material away, eating it away, eating it away, and ultimately new stars will will form from within that cocoon. And then if you get up in the early morning, it's a, this is going to be upside down again, but for those who are familiar with Corvus, constellation Corvus, it's always good to, if you want to just draw a plumb line, go straight down and you can find the, the Southern Cross with Alpha and Beta Centauri uh, also marking it. Now, and then, of course, the entire section in the early morning, and I have it upside down here, because this is the way you would, you would actually see it, with the Southern Cross, the Colsat, the Dark Colsat Nebula, Alpha and Beta Centauri, and here's the Eta Carina Nebula. So it's one of the brightest sections that's between the Southern Cross, and then also, I can point it out right yeah, here, is the False Cross. Here's a close-up of the, this is a close-up of the Colsat Nebula, one of the dark nebulosities that you can see uh, through binoculars with the knot, your naked eye. And this little knot right here, right off of, um, I think that's gamma, is the jewel box cluster. And that's the jewel box, it's just a very pretty, Beautiful star with a red star at the center, at the core. I'm getting a battery stretch here. Okay, well, I don't know how to get to that. 
this is the, this one. But this is Ada Carina. Now Ada Carina is another fantastic star forming region. And it's just, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Alright, it's a beautiful star forming region. Once again, with dark nebulosity covering um, all this brighter uh, swaths of gas. And so we have a rich field of gas and dust with all these little nodules, which are basically being uh, eaten away, blown away by stellar winds. You can see these stellar bubbles who, that's photoionizing all these small little pieces of nebulosity, and out of which, again, even in the smallest little sections, you would, you would have new stars forming in all these little strange clumps that you see here. And everything is being blown out, just this billowing gas cloud. And here's a wider version of that same uh, scape. All of this from the Hubble Space Telescope in the wide field. It's just like sort of a visual chaos of, it's, it's stunning. And that's creation. The keyhole, we're going to look at the, um, this little section right there, just at the end with the Hubble Space Telescope, totally transforms it. Look at it. Let's look at the intricate way that the, the winds, stellar winds, are shaping all these forms and sculpting. It's constantly sculpting, constantly changing. That one's obscene. And that one. And they, uh, that is the Eta. So at the center, this is the star, believe it or not, Eta Carina. You don't be able to see it. You might, to the naked eye, you'll see this star called Eta Carina, which had a massive explosion uh, in the 1800s. And if you can imagine this, it'd be like there's a napkin ring, and there's two balloons being blown out of it. And that star is likely to be the next, probably the next supernova in our, in our galaxy. And here, just to show you, like, went to get the Eta Carina Nebula, if you have there's a wonderful cluster, 3132, this one, and it's called the Pink Cushion Cluster. And then off of here, is probably one of the most neglected clusters in the southern sky, NGC 3293. It's, uh, it's, called, it's called the spider spin. But I think it's more beautiful than the jewel box. It's about the same size, but it's even, it's even more stunning than the jewel box. And we're going to leave with This is Centaurus. Here you have uh, the cross. And up here in Centaurus, you have Omega Centauri. And above it, you have Centaurus A. I just wanted to show you this, because we end with this beautiful object. This is the result of a cannib cannibalization between two galaxies. So you have this entire dust ring is left over from two galaxies colliding. So two galaxies you probably did about millions of years ago, 20 years, and just did a dance. And then they came together, and then they collided. And here, the, the dust was stripped off one of the galaxies, which is probably like our own Milky Way, and then it, it settled into this dust ring. Meanwhile, something is going on in here. You can see these entire giant radio lobes. You can't see them because they're actually radio wavelengths. But they believe that there's not only uh, a supermassive black hole, which has 55 times the mass of the sun, but they believe that there may be two or more black holes at the core. Especially, you know, which can't happen if you have two galaxies in near collision and they can go in and spin. And if each galaxy has a black hole at its core, if they merge, the black holes can uh, coexist. So I'm just going to end with uh, this final uh, Oh, One of the things that constellations that Lacaille made was reticulum, which is 
used or the reticle would be used in his eyepiece. But of course, a lot of you might know about his reticulum. It's a tiny little constellation, it's like a little diamond. And then this is a star called Zeta Reticuli. And now you can only see it down here. You might have known about Zeta Reticuli because in the 1950s, uh, Betty and Barney Hill said they were abducted by UFOs and that they were they came from Zeta Reticuli. And this is the star map the aliens drew for her. Okay, just so you know, and there they are. This is supposed to be a real photo of an alien from Zeta Reticuli living here on Earth. And if you ever want the if you ever want the site, you should really write this down <laughs> until it's because it's about the Zeta Reticuli and the future of the world, the hybrid children. So these are the children. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you should, no, she explains it very well. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> a lot better than I can. But I have, if you're interested, I'll bring my iPad to lunch and you can write down the text because you should listen to it. And uh, that, I guess that's the end. I, <laughs> I guess I'm one of the hybrids. All right. So thank you very much. <laughs> Anything? I know. <laughs> I ended with that one. I don't know. Yeah, that's good. Okay, yes. Yeah. You're talking about the globular clusters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the order of astronomical units. So, I mean, if you were to have, if you were to be in the center of a globular cluster, let's put it this way. Um, I don't have the exact distances off my head. But if you were in the center of a globular cluster, it's just a typical one, and not a tremendously tight one. Every, every, your sky, night sky, would be filled with series. You know, so. Yeah, well, see if, yeah, this would be on the order of probably the, um, a typical globular cluster is about, um, let's see, that's a good way. I'm going to say about 50 light years across. So a typical globular cluster might be on the, on the order of about 50 light years across. So it would be daylight. I mean, you'd have constant, you know, twilight. But so then it depends on, so if it's 50 light years across, then you have to look at the size and how many stars you have. And so order of, uh, some stars are binary systems. That's what I'm saying, in, in the globular cluster, it's so, it, it's so dense that there are binary stars, there are, uh, so like I said, from astronomical units to uh, light years away. You know, our, our closest star, I mean, let's put it this way, our closest star is four light years away, and we're not doing any kind of dance with it. So you're gonna have, um, and it's not even that, you know, that bright, so you're looking at on orders of magnitude less than that. Would you agree? <laughs> <laughs> That's sure. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Yes, anyway, is there another question? Is that good? Okay. <coughs> The Hawaiians used to laugh at the English sailors, like Cook, and who, who came in, and they, they were always impressed at how the Hawaiians navigated. And the Hawaiians would say, oh, we navigate because the wind blows. You see the Milky Way curve, the wind blows that direction. Hey, anyway, so they, 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 they actually didn't use the Milky Way, per se. You know, they used stars. When they used, what they did was they used stars coming out of pits on the, on the horizon. They called them Rua, R-U-A. And so they knew certain stars would appear in certain directions that would rise at a given time at a certain location to keep them.
I don't, the, the, it, what I've learned is that. What about Dr. Mike? We both have a, 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 a mutual acquaintance named Scott Roberts, who uh, was at one time the vice president for uh, outreach and marketing, I think, for Mead Instruments. And there was a time when uh, many, many, many telescopes were being sold that were uh, these inexpensive 60 millimeter long refractors on spindly tripod kind of things that, that we've probably all seen or, or disparaged or what have you. And one day, uh, Scott was looking around the, um, the, uh, uh, the Mead lot, and there was a, uh, a trailer full, full of pallets and pallets and pallets of these, you know, boxed up, imported from China uh, telescopes that were about to be destroyed. And he, he dropped a dime to the one person he knew who could do something uh, with them useful. He called Mike Reynolds. And he said, Mike, can you, I've got this, I've got this trailer full of telescopes, 60 millimeter telescopes, do you want them? <laughs> And so Mike accepted the challenge, and uh, the, the telescopes were shipped out to him. This was about, what, five years ago, Mike? Maybe? Yes, it's about five years about ago. About five years ago. And uh, they were shipped out to Mike in Florida, and he managed to distribute them to Boy Scouts and schools and, and all the groups. And uh, like Johnny Appleseed, there's a trail across central Florida where, uh, where telescopes have been planted in the hands of a, a lot of people who could make use of them. That gives you a, a little bit of a, an insight into the, the truly um, generous and, and forward thinking that, that Mike puts into a lot of what he does, both with his students at his school and uh, just in the, the, greater, the greater astronomical community. So with that little pleasant thought in mind, I'd like to reintroduce to you Dr. Mike Reynolds, who's going to tell us today about uh, how to photograph the upcoming eclipse, or if you, all, if you think you already know maybe some of the finer points that, uh, that will help make your uh, photographs and videos better. Dr. Mike. Thank you, Kelly. And actually, those telescopes ended up going all over the world. Um, I know that a one major um, palette went to um, Albuquerque that was used in their library, the number of them went overseas, they literally went, they went nationwide. And the scary thing is when Scott called me, he said, Mike, I know you're really good with outreach and how important it is to you. Um, we've got some telescopes. Actually, there were some fairly decent Mead instruments in this batch. He said, we've got some telescopes. I said, how many, Scott? He said, well, we'll take care of all the shipping. I said, how many, Scott? He said, well, we'll package them all up and wrap them for you. How many, Scott? We'll be glad to take care of everything on this end. How many, Scott? It was seven trailer loads of telescopes. Seven. There were like 4,000 telescopes. And so the local amateurs did a great job sorting through them, piecing the things together, making sure they worked. Training sessions for scouts and parks. And it really was a lot of fun, but I remember Debbie saying, and those telescopes are going... Where can you imagine seeing not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not but seven trailers pulling up out front of your house, unloading pallet after pallet after pallet after pallet after pallet of telescopes? So it was a lot of fun. You are in the right place. We are going to talk about eclipses and, in particular, specifically eclipse photography. Just a couple of follow ups. I love the opportunity to talk to all of you about. The topics we talk about, it's a lot of fun, and you can tell that we have a lot of fun doing it too. I know I talked a lot the other day about using the image stabilize systems, but you know what? You are probably the best IS there is, depending on how you prop your arms, and Steve O'Meara and I were having a great conversation about this, how you prop your arms or how you hold the binoculars. Don't forget, you are an IS system. And also, Kelly brought this up too, and I just want to add this back in again. The law of good binoculars today have a collimation or alignment feature. If you get a bad pair of binoculars that go out of alignment, the worst thing you do is to use them, honestly. The best thing to do is to get rid of them, because you'll never have a good view. And it is very personal. It's just, and since I'm going to talk about eclipse astronomy, just uh, eclipse photography, it's kind of a personal type of thing. And I'll mention one other thing. And Steve already mentioned it with his 
luncheon. I'm going to have a luncheon um, that's going to be about meteorites. Uh, one of my talks I'll give in a few days. Uh, Tuesday the 13th will be about uh, meteorite astronomy. That's quite a bit of research I do. And so a couple days after that, we'll do another noonish, again, um, back in Ocean View Lounge for those of us who want to gather and have an informal discussion about meteoritics and cratering and finding meteorites and the meteorite men and all those things you'd like to talk about. And we'll post it out the Travel Quest table also just as a reminder, but nonetheless, it'll give you an opportunity to sit and talk on all walks from space. I'll be giving you a talk about that before we get there. But today's talk is about solar eclipse photography. And I'm going to say a couple things here right off hand. Um, first of all, this is a wonderful eclipse opportunity. And most of you have seen the path for the eclipse itself. Steve's going to talk more about phenomena. I'm not going to even really touch much about what you can see. I'm a focus, pun intended, get focus on photography. But I just want to remind you by uh, the path and the area that we're expecting to observe the eclipse from. Um, it's a great opportunity. It should be a wonderful, wonderful eclipse. But today, what I'm going to spend the next hour or so talking about, um, a little bit about photography and imaging and how we've made that transition very, very quickly. Um, quite a bit about equipment, what to image, some tips, and you're going to hear me, you're going to hear me say several things several times, like strobe off, tape over that flash, that strobe, if you can't figure out how to turn it off, because if you don't figure out how to turn it off, someone will turn it off for you the day of the eclipse, trust me. Um, Post-eclipse imaging, I'll talk just a little bit about that, and then um, close, question, answer. I do have another handout, and that's a trait of a college professor, I guess, is that there are handouts, I put some up here in the very front, there are again some in the back, and we'll return them to the Travel Quest trailer. If you Trailer? Do we have a trailer? <laughs> table, how about that? The Travel Quest table, if you'd like to pick up an extra or direct friends who are not here, they'll be able to pick up some handouts, and they'll be there uh, throughout the, at least throughout the eclipse. And so you'll have that opportunity to pick that up. And remember, there was also information that we were all emailed earlier, some really good stuff on Eclipse imaging. So let's just talk a little about imaging itself. Um, I like to kind of talk about photography in the beginning, reminding you that John Draper, um, a chemistry professor um, who did some of the very early photographic work and, and his very early photograph of the moon in 1839 really was a, a bad photo. And if you follow that up with some of the early eclipse photos, this was taken in January 1st, 1889, and that's not a bad photo. It was taken by Charles Burkhalter, who is the director of the Chabot Observatory in Oakland, California, the facility I ended up having the great honor of, of directing for 12 years. But nonetheless, that's not a bad photo, is it, for 1889, and thinking about all that they had to go through. Um, we have made this great transition. When I was working on my PhD, you know, was, we were into all the film chemistry. Um, Dr. Alex Smith was one of my professors, and, and um, we were doing all the hypering of film and all that wonderful stuff, cool cameras and cool emulsion. And it's like everything I learned how to do, it's all gone now. So we used to, you know, we used to talk about um, equipment, um, the, the cameras relatively inexpensive. Today's really good DSLRs are quite a bit more expensive. Film, compared to imaging, I mean, it's just amazing. You know, I went out to photograph sunset last night. I took like 200 photos of sunset. What do you need 200? What do you need 200 photos? Well, you need digital. You just throw them away. You find the ones you like, and, and, and so you throw the rest away. So this is a major advantage for us as eclipse chasers and, and imagers. Um, you had to process film. You had these immediate results, which I really like. That's a major advantage for us also. Um, in the old day, you do a lot of image manipulation inside the darkroom today, you go inside the computer and do your 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 um, manipulation. Kelly harasses me about adding green flashes to my sunset photos, but I'm um, actually they're more of a kind of greenish, no, I'm just kidding. But nonetheless, um, the ability to go in, and I'll show you an example of that. Hopefully it'll show up fairly decently. And um, again, all sorts of techniques we would develop 
we would chill the film, we would hyper the film, we would heat the film, we do all sorts of things just to play a little bit with the magic um, that we call that photographic emulsion. And today, these challenges are much easier to control, and that's very true for Eclipse astronomy. So I will not be surprised someone on board will have a film camera and take film images. And, and um, you know, this, not all of us have passed. I, I'm taking digital to say So there's all sorts, you have all sorts of, all sorts of equipment opportunities. Um, cell phones and iPads and tablets, the point-and-shoot cameras, which are actually pretty darn good. The digital SLRs and DSLRs. Um, some of you bought camcorders, and I guess I'll bet you there are one or two or three or four people out there that actually have film cameras, which can give you very good results again. I know there's a couple of Eclipse chasers who only shoot eclipses with plates, photographic plates, but most of us have made that great transition. I think the last eclipse I shot was, I'll show, a photo, show you a photo of it, um, with film was um, 2001. So things have changed makes it a lot easier in some ways for each of us to kind of take that Kodak moment, should we say, of totality or of people surrounding. We'll talk about that. Now, if any of you brought something like this to photograph with, good luck, because, um, you know, this is a land-based setup, and of course we're on a cruise ship, and um, I didn't see anyone hauling any heavy equatorial mounts and, you know, CCD set setups and such as that on board. But for our pleasure, we're going to be looking at using much simpler systems because we are on a cruise ship, and that's some of the things I want to talk about. This is my sixth cruise total solar eclipse, and so I've had, a, you know, well, I've been to 17, I've imaged 17, back to the film days, March 7, 1970, on forward, so I've, I've taken photos of each of the eclipses I've been to, and so I've developed some techniques that work great for me, may not work for you, but just some of these things I'll share with you. And um, I actually come equipped with several different options, and depending on eclipse day, depending on uh, how much a shot the ship is rocking back and forth, all those variables will um, put me in a position where I decide what to actually use. Um, again, some of you have cell phones. I'm going to tell you, I mentioned this, I think, the other day. It's amazing what you can image with a cell phone. I would, if I were you, I'll show you one of my favorite, very favorite photographs, which is not a cell phone, but point and just a little bit, but even the iPads, um, you can actually do some fairly decent imaging with some of these new devices, the tablets, and so on. Some things to consider. This is a checklist that's really, 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 really important. Make certain, make certain your batteries are charged. Your batteries are charged. Let me say it one more time charged batteries. And you have memory cards that have enough room to take photos of the clips on. The worst thing to do, the worst thing, it's like running out of film, but there's no real excuse except someone like me thinks, well, I will honestly probably take a thousand images of the eclipse. That sounds crazy, but I just will take lots and lots of images of the eclipse. But make sure you've got enough room on that memory card. In fact, even a fresh memory card, a backup memory card, these are little electromechanical beasties and things that go wrong, but charged batteries. Oh my God, that's so important. I like, and it sounds crazy again, but having a flashlight with me. Red's preferred. But you've got to remember, we're talking about a total solar eclipse. Things are going to get, hopefully, a little bit dark. And so you're you know, messing around your camera and you can't see it and you're getting frustrated and totality's approaching. You see a shadow coming on and you can't see what you're doing. So um, I like having a little bit of a flashlight. Some people bring tape recorders, two purposes. Some people bring it with like a pre-recorded T minus one minute, take the you know, lens cap off the camera, T minus 30 seconds, getting ready for second contact, get ready to take the filter off, things like that. Other people like to record what's going on, the, the joy, the happiness, the celebration, the reaction of people. Um, it, it can be a lot of fun. As much as I hate to say this next one, I'm just going to tell you, I bring plastic covers to put over my equipment just in case, you know, we go through some rainy patches or whatever. It's just one of those things I like to do to make sure I can cover up my thousands and thousands of dollars in, in photographic equipment. And then don't forget, when you're making your list to take out with you, 
your solar filter and eclipse glasses. Gotta have those. So this just gives you kind of that, that little bit of a checklist of things. And you gotta remember, you're gonna hear us say this time and time again. I'm just gonna repeat it because I'm talking about photography, but you got to deal with safety first. It's absolutely paramount, you know, whether you're observing, whether you're observing or you're looking through a telescope, you got to make sure you're using the proper equipment. Now, by the way, this gives a new definition to the term sun dog. So, thank you, thank you. And, and now, Kelly's, I'm really going to owe Kelly a drink for this one. Um, here's Kelly. It's a little dark, unfortunately, on the screen, but Kelly making um, many, 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 many um, solar filters. And so I'm going to owe you a drink or two and for us to tell you the story behind this particular expedition on Easter Island a couple years ago, you owe us a couple drinks. But nonetheless, um, there will be some sessions helping people make solar filters and that will be part of it. So you got to remember, again, I'm hitting the safety thing. You're here several times. Whether you're imaging, you're viewing, you got to make sure you have the proper filter. you got to. You know, it's got to be in the proper arrangement. You've got to do that. It's just uh, so paramount that uh, no matter how many times you say it, you know, it's just got to be done. And that'll be redundant. So here, here's one of my favorite peanuts comments. I think you probably actually read it. So here's Lucy. She's saying to Linus, what's this about not being able to look at the eclipse? Linus responds, it's very dangerous. You could suffer severe burns of retina from infrared rays. Lucy goes off and says, What's the sense in having the eclipse if you can't look at it? Someone in production sure slipped up this time. And so, it, it, most of you know, it's, the par, it's looking at the sun is the issue. It's not the eclipse, it's looking at the sun. And um, whether you're a sun dog or a human or whatever it happens to be, you've got to take that proper precaution. So, totality, you'll hear these countdowns, totality, you want to make sure your glasses are off your eyes, your, your filter's off your camera, or your your um, video cam, whatever, and then you put them back on at what's known as third contact. Again, this is Steve's going to be going through a lot of these details for you as far as what to look for. I'm going to get the photography stuff. Um, I was I brought a telescope, but I'm now leaning more towards using a 350 millimeter lens. In fact, this is the setup I photographed um, a couple days ago. Um, some of you have seen me hauling this particular camera. This is a Canon um, digital single lens reflex. It's a it's a 5D Mark II, which I really like, and a 350 millimeter telephoto with, see it right there, nice red arrow pointing at red circle around my, my filter to allow me to, to photograph the, the partial phases of the eclipse itself. So you've got to make certain, again, I, I hate to keep hammering on this, and some of you say, Reynolds, we get it. Some people will say, what did he just say? You've got to have this filter in front of any optical system, whether it be a camera, video camera, binocular, or your eyes. You don't put your, your solar glasses on, then look through your binoculars, okay? Um, again, I, we'll be saying this ad nauseum, we just want to make sure people are safe, and, and it, it, so it's, it's, it, it's important. Um, some cautions and advices, again, about solar filters. I'm dealing mainly here with the camera end of it. Um, make sure it's the right type of filter. If you have any questions, see one of us, we'll be glad to help you. Make sure it's securely attached so a bump or wind won't jar it loose. You know, we're gonna be cruising along at a certain speed. And again, Kelly will tell you more of those details. And so you just don't want, you know, you're there photographing or looking through your binoculars or whatever that this thing gets whipped off and you're, you know, then looking at the sun. Uh, you need to be able to easily remove it at second contact and then put it back on. Because listen, totality's coming. You see the shadow, the breeze, the colors are on the horizon. You feel the excitement, and you're fumbling trying to get your filter off. And three minutes later, you're still fumbling trying to get your filter off, and you've missed the eclipse. So, you know, that's something you practice and work on in advance because you don't want to miss it. But you want to be safe at the same time. So there's that balance. Um, and again, if you have a finder scope, on your telescope, and some of you bought telescopes, make sure you seal it off or no one can look through it or you have a filter on it. I have a scope with a finder scope. If I bring the scope up, I'm not even gonna put the finder on it. I don't wanna take the chance. Um, 
and it's not that I don't, I trust all of you, it's just what happens is like, you know, I'm saying something gets blown off, so we'll talk more about that. So what to image, let's get into the fun stuff. This is the fun stuff here. And again, I've been very, very fortunate, I've been to so many eclipses. First of all, imaging people. One of the best memories I have of, of the eclipses I've been to is looking back over the years at, at photos of, of the people I was at with the eclipse. Um, this is um, actually the 2009 eclipse. Um, we were um, Gilbert Islands, um, what's known as Carabots, and a um, little island, and the people were so warm and friendly. We brought them with solar viewers, and, and they just absolutely, absolutely loved it. So taking pictures of people is a very memorable thing to do. Again, you're going to hear this time and time again. I'm sorry for sounding like a broken record, but I'm going to sound like it again. You're going to hear it again and again. Don't flash anyone. Don't flash anyone. Either way, you know, photo flash or the, you know, the other type of flashing. Don't flash people. But if you need help trying to figure out how to turn off your flash, get it in advance. I'm going to tell you now, all of you know this, Those, a lot of you have been to eclipses. Someone will not turn off their flash. Right? I mean, we've, we've all been there. Someone will not turn off their flash. And that person's likely to be the one that's kind of um, sacrificed as they go overboard with their camera. So make sure you turn off your flash. You need help with it again in advance. We're more than glad to help you. We have a couple ways to, to deal with that. Okay, taking pictures of people before or after totality is preferred because you have a little bit higher light levels and it's just it's a fun way to take a look at people's equipment. Again, notice Notice, notice you know, the filters that people are using here. And um, just again, use, use caution. I know I keep on saying that. I apologize profusely. You can tell my college professors I repeat things. They say things well, for some of our students 273 times for people to hear things. Um, this is at the annular last May. And these are actually our grandsons, Kieran and Quinny, and um, enjoying the, the annular eclipse. So again, those people pictures. Um, are really, really great. You know, if your friends, your family, those on the ship, that sort of thing. And then there are other memories too. <laughs> this is um, from Easter Island. And of course, the, the wonderful, great statues. And someone drew a little comic of yours truly. And you know, here we are, we're looking. Kelly, you remember how spectacular she had these wonderful, you know, the, the thing that makes Easter Island so special, an eclipse sun sun and then of course people's reaction to it and of course from the, the wonderful movie um museum you dumb dumb give me gum gum of course i'm saying after the eclipse after the eclipse it's kind of surreal and kelly and cheryl debbie well, we all kind of remember this from, the, from this particular eclipse in that you had the easter island and what can you say you had this eclipse at the same time the world cup final was going on and I'm thinking to myself, you know, well, first of all, here's poor Kelly. He's making filters like crazy right up the second contact. I'm helping people with the cameras right up the second contact. And these people in here watching the World Cup. It's like, dude, there's an eclipse going on. And I think you got these statues. You're watching the World Cup. But you know, maybe their focus was a little different. All right, so a lot of you bought digital camcorders. Fantastic opportunities to do all sorts of great things. Um, in the past, what I've done is I have this setting on my camcorder that allows me to take an image every 10 seconds. And I put the camcorder on a tripod, and I'm talking about on a cruise ship here, I'm not talking about on land, but on a tripod, I kind of aim it towards people and let it take an image every 10 seconds. So you end up with like two hours, it goes by in like a minute and 30 seconds or two minutes, and um, people scurrying around, the light goes down, Light comes back up. It's a fabulous way to record people around you. Um, some people do that for before second contact, after third contact, and actually video the eclipse itself. I've seen some fantastic videos of totality with today's camcorder. Just really very fine, very very fine equipment. Um, but if you do this sort of like people video or surrounding deck video, you may get a little bit of the shadow. You should get some of the colors around the horizon. You'll get a diminishing and increasing light depending on how you set your camera. So you should play a little bit with that in advance if you haven't already. 
Um, partial phases, um, you don't have to use a telescope. You don't have to use a telephoto to get great um, partial phase images. Um, some of you know the trick of using pinholes, and as the sun, um, should I say, the, the dragon eats the sun, finer and finer crescent, you get these wonderful projections of um, pinholes, of, of pinhole eclipses. And since we don't have a lot of trees on this ship, you may have to bring your own straw hat or make your own. In fact, my grandsons, what they did for last, and these done by you know eight year old and eleven year old, so it's not too too bad. They took a piece of cardboard before they left home. They punched holes in it. Of course, it's a little fuzzy because of the projecting system here. And then they took pictures of the partially eclipsed sun. Really easy to do. Um, kind of fun. It, it actually is a you know as an astronomer slash physicist guy. It's kind of fun to explain how pinhole projection, the physics that works. But it's it's really kind of very nice to do. Um, partial phases again easy enough to shoot. I've often heard people say, uh, the partial is good as it gets you to totality. But then there are um, people like me who say, well, okay, third contact, why don't we just continue imaging until we get out of this thing altogether. So there'll be some of us who continue to image. This is, again, the eclipse that several of us were at in 2010 on Easter Island. And um, it's wonderful as you start approaching second contact, just seeing that very thin crescent, and uh, that's an anticipation of totality coming. Um, if you're using simple cameras, point and shoots in particular, cell phones, iPads, tablets, consider taking pictures of people, of the horizon. You get these wonderful colors around the horizon that are, are it can be exquisite. Uh, quite often you can see the shadow coming towards you. There's just a variety of things that you can photo, and maybe we'll see some shadow bands, and there's a variety of opportunities. Again, these are things that Steve will be talking about, and I don't want to steal his thunder. Um, so, think about the point shoot cameras. A lot of them have them, have, a lot of us have those. I have one too. And um, what do you do is if you want to shoot totality? You know, most of the day's digital point and shoots have a optical zoom and then an electronic or digital zoom. Depending on your camera, it's best probably only to use the optical zoom. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment because when you start using digital zoom, you end up with a variety of issues. And uh, my suggestion, again, it depends on you, and, and try it. I mean, heck, I'd love to have somebody produce some wonderful photographs using uh, digital zoom. Uh, it, it just doesn't give me as good of a, of a quality. The camera, most of even our simple point and shoots, you can set the image sensor sensitivity. It's called, in the old days, it was called ASA or ISO. We still use that sort of nomenclature. And the problem is, as you, as you bump that up too high, electronic noise gets to be too high. And so we usually suggest, and you'll see both in my handout and the one that Travel Quest circulated, a maximum setting of about 400 um, ISO. Again, we can help you with that. Um, what else to image? Well, again, I'm going to tell you, just not just the eclipses. There's going to be a lot of people imaging the eclipse, and, and I'm more than willing, more than willing to share any of the pictures I take with, with, with you. Um, but you start looking around, you see these beautiful colors around the horizon and the shadow itself. It's just spectacular. In fact, one of my very favorite pictures I took at the 2009 eclipse on um, Marique, which is again part of Kiribati, was I used a point and shoot camera. This is, this is not fancy equipment, folks. This is a point and shoot. And I preset it, I focused on the top. On the ship, you can see people. You can see them, but even those the poor, poor guy holding the binoculars, people looking up, and the eclipse sun above. That's one of my favorite pictures. And you'll see some of my other photos too. But I just that's just such a gorgeous photo and tells such a wonderful story. Yes, people are shadowy. This is where you don't want your flash going off, by the way. Um, but just to me, just a really nice photograph that you know people can take. Um, digital cameras. The DSLRs, again, um, have really changed the way we image things. I know both Sky and Tell and Astronomy 
I've kind of done reviews of these. I just did a review a couple years ago on the on the cannons, and you know, they're just they're really very very good. And so, one of the things you want to think about, as I said, steady as she goes. We'll talk about a little bit more about what that means in a moment, because you already know. As I sit back up here or stand up here, kind of rocking back and forth, we know that some of our challenges being on a cruise ship. And so, you know, you want to take a look at the optimal, you know, focal length on your lens. I'm going to be using a 350 millimeter telephoto, but I'm also going to be using um, raw images so I can bump it up very big. I'm going to be using a variety of exposures. So I have some options there. And so you can use a bit smaller of a lens in it, rather than a telescope if you want to, if you want to, um, and it can control other variations. You know, there's all sorts of things. And like I've talked a lot about, and I keep on harping about the image stabilized lens. And, um, the lens I'll be using is an IS lens, and I'll be using it on a tripod. We know things rock back and forth, but I've done my homework. I'm gonna show you that in just a moment. Um, and these IS lenses help a little bit with the vibrations and the wind itself. I like shooting in bursts, and I'll explain why in just a moment as the kind of the sun drifts through your field of view, and the shorter exposures, you're more guaranteed to get things. But I'm a, I roll the dice during a total solar eclipse. I shoot a whole range of images. The worst thing that can happen is, hey, you know, the 60th of a second's too much motion, I can't use it, but at least I try. So I'll shoot a variety, and I do, I go all my imaging manually. I've tried computers, I've tried auto. I just like to have the control of the camera. I know my camera well enough where I can easily adjust it during totality. If you don't, don't fumble with it. In fact, I'll give you one of my last slides will be that sort of warning. Um, videography, again, some of you will be doing um, video work, fantastic opportunities. You can also do it with a number of your DSLRs. Just make sure you've got enough room on your memory card. Really important. You don't want to get the second contact and you've just taken tons of great pictures of the partial face, and here comes the diamond ring, and you're out of memory. Um, you'll be jumping overboard. So do be really careful, and don't be fumbling around putting your memory card in 30 seconds before totality, because you'll be fumbling around doing that, and you'll miss it again. So kind of gauge it, look at those things, think about what you want to do in advance, uh, and, and it will have much more enjoyable capability. Again, if you've got uh, video cam, experiment with zoom capabilities, get your filter, go out now. Do not wait till the morning eclipse, go out now and experiment with that. Experiment with the focus. That's a major bugaboo I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, considering in imaging people, shadows, colors, and the guidelines are very similar again for DSLRs. If you're going to use your DSLR in the movie mode, like a lot of the Nikons and Canons now will shoot, a digital camera will shoot in the movie mode. But understand the power draw that'll take and understand how much memory it's going to take. So just some things to consider. Um, once you get back home, you can do things like stacking images. This is um, a series of five images I took in 2006 on a cruise ship. Should I repeat that again? On a cruise ship in the Mediterranean. I went back and in Photoshop, I stacked the images to give you, I think, just a spectacular looking image. It's, it's, you can see definitely the various, again, you know, I'm going to say all this for Steve to talk about, but you can see the various details that, um, that you look for visually. And to me, that's been one of the challenges in the past, is being able to photograph what your eye sees visually. It's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. Again, this is, I'm going to show you some photographs and show you a range of exposures, just so you get a feel. This is the, what's known as the um, second contact. Uh, the diamond ring, this is a two thousandth of a second exposure. And again, you can see just about right as far as exposure. And um, I was shooting a, an ASA or ISO of, of, of 400. Uh, say again? Oh, yeah, this was F11. I shoot a little, I shoot, you know, a little um, strains there maybe, but that's, it paid off the long run, which you'll see in this moment. Um, this is a third contact, and I, hopefully, I think you're going to see it on the next photograph. By the time we got the third contact for this particular eclipse, this was again, it's Easter Island, some very thin clouds moved in. We're all saying, ah, oh, thank goodness we saw the eclipse, we got some thin clouds. So I got back, I started looking at my images, and I said, what are these thin lines 
running through my image. And so I did a little Photoshop contrast. And hopefully you can see these, and I'll bring my computer along later, and you can take a look. If you, you look and see, there are thin lines running like this. Those are shadow bands. By using F11, I was able to get enough contrast, enough field of depth between the cloud and the sky to photograph shadow bands in the sky. I mean, I, did you ever see them visually? I don't, I don't think anybody ever saw them visually. But there are shadow bands in the sky. And the first time I'm saying, these dang digital cameras aren't worth a crap, you know, that sort of thing. And I said, oh my god, is this what I think it is? And, he going in, and I did put in a green flash, though. You've been probably no green flash, but but you can just see, and I think you probably can see it again on my computer. You can see it much better. Those very wonderful thin lines and shadow bands, and it was just a. I was in the right place, at the right time. The conditions were perfect, and um, there you go. So that's ASA 400 again. Yes, and again, I'll, I'll bring my equipment down here. My guy take, take a look what what I'm doing, but you know what? Do your own thing because. You know, it's like binoculars in a sense. It's kind of personal and what you want to do. So, some imaging tips for camera settings, camera support, rocking ships, all those sorts of things. Um, first of all, some things you probably haven't even thought about inside of a ship. You know, it's kind of cooler, lower humidity. You go outside, it's a little warmer, higher humidity. Be careful condensation. Because what's going to happen in many cases, you're going to take your equipment out in the morning of the eclipse and notice the lenses are fogging. Just be prepared for that. And um, so just something to keep in mind. I've, I've experimented with that already. I'm a, I'm a good geek scientist. I've already done several of these experiments. Note the, wet, the deck conditions. Um, Debbie and I were out photographing sunset last night. And we noticed how salty the rails are, how salty the chairs are. So just be familiar with that. Remember, you have photographic equipment, so be careful with that. Um, obviously, protect yourself, sun and hydration. And again, just be prepared to protect your equipment. It's just one of those words of warning that I, I would like to add. And hopefully, we won't need to do that. But again, just something to, to, to be aware of. Um, I always set my camera to shoot raw images, and it gobbles up memory cards like crazy, but it allows me to image a little smaller of a sun and go back later and do better and blow it up very big. So I always shoot um, in, in raw images. I shoot a raw and a JPEG, and the, the Canon allows me to do that. Um, again, what happens with some of the older digital cameras when you're shooting raw, it takes some time for the memory card to remember your image. And so there's a little bit of a lag. So just be prepared for that. Again, I usually shoot around 400 ISO. It'll depend on what I see the morning of the eclipse. Um, I will not shoot any faster than that. Even if we have some overcast, I'll probably stick with 400 ISO. And it, it, you know, those things can change depending on what we see. But that's just based on my experience. Again, that's my recommendation. Um, again, I know I keep on saying these things, and forgive me, but I just, it's the teacher in me. Make sure your batteries are charged. Make sure your camera media is in the camera. Don't forget to put it in. Put it in the camera, make sure it's got plenty of space. There it is again. I know you're tired of hearing it. Turn off your shoulder flash again. We'll help you with that. And maybe one of the bigger things to consider and play with in advance on your camera is the focus. Most of our cameras, video, point and shoot, DSLRs, are autofocus. Your camera will have problems, your lens will have problems, most of them will have problems focusing on the eclipse of the sun. So, I was really, 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 really advised in advance, check your focus, put it on manual and do that yourself because you can have beautiful shots if they're out of focus. Um, you'll be contacting me for an image. I hope you will anyway. Um, focus is so important. Man. It's so important. You can see focus, focus, focus. And you think, talk to Kelly. Talk, you can talk to any of us who do, Steve, those of us who do a lot of astronomical work. 
And the thing that can ruin really good astronomical images is poor focus. It's just like having a poorly focused image when you're trying to look through a pair of binoculars or a telescope. It's the same thing. So focus, 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 focus. And let me give you a little bit of interesting background here. I was doing a, an article review, uh, an equipment review for astronomy. And so I was playing around with different lenses. And you know, most, if you look at your camera and you've got a manual focus opportunity, which most of our DSLRs do, you'll notice the symbol for infinity, little bracket, and the little indicator on the lens itself. I did some experimentation, guess what? Infinity isn't, it's, it's like, oh my God, it's nuts. In fact, you, it goes back and forth and you really need to check it, so please, make sure that you're checking where infinity is. I was being a good geek scientist, I was up last night checking my particular lens. I think I'm going to use the morning eclipse to see where infinity looked like it was going to be. We want to check a day of the eclipse because you hate to have these great pictures. You know, everything works out fine. Batteries charge, you have room on your on your memory card, you know, it's nice and clear, yada yada yada, and you're off focus. And by the way, once you get the focus where it needs to be, lock it. Lock it. Because you'll get excited and the eclipse is take off your filter and all of a sudden, you bumped the focus. So figure out in advance how to lock that focus if you can, because I was really surprised that infinity wasn't. That sounds weird, doesn't it? But it just turned out it wasn't so. Um, how long of an exposure? You're gonna have some options there. Um, auto, which a lot of your point and shoots, um, video cameras, they'll take Basically, one image, one image exposure, and um, that's it. A lot of the cameras today have um, auto plus or minus one or two stops we call bracketing. If you don't want to get into the sophistication that some of us get into, that's probably a good option. You need to read your manual. We'll be good, again, glad to help you as much as we can, as long as not during the eclipse. We're glad to help you as much as we can even then. Um, and, and, Bracket if you can, so it'll give you different types of exposures. I've used both, man I've used all of these. I've used manual, I use computer control. I personally, and it's just Mike Reynolds, geek Mike Reynolds likes to have his finger on the knob, and my wife's over joining the clips, and I'm over here going back and forth. I, I know it's 24, you're going to laugh, it is 24 clicks from 1 8,000th of a second down to 1 30th of a second. I just know it. I just, I just know what, and so I got that kind of down. I often will use a, you know, a remote controller for my camera. It really depends on the circumstance and what the weather's like, and all those sorts of variables. I'm ready to go with that too. Now, to give you some idea of differences of exposure again, um, this was f11, um, about 350. Actually, this was this was a f11. And I was using an Explore 80 millimeter Apo to shoot this particular series, and um, using the Canon 5D Mark II. But to give you some idea, this is an eight thousandth of a second, and I've got some nice air corona detail here. And you can see again as the exposures change, how those details change. Now, one thing you may notice here at the bottom. These are both one sixteen hundredth of a second exposure, but they're two different times during, the, during totality. A little bit different feel, a little bit different view, because as, that, as the moon moves across the face of the sun, you're going to have different parts, and again, Steve's going to the great detail about this too, different parts of the sun's characteristics exposed. So, you know, but I like photographing, that's my thing, so you get a feel for, for how that works out. A little bit longer exposure again, look, five hundredth of a second, even in this bad, not the greatest of projectors. I mean, you can really see some nice streamer detail up here. And again, getting longer and longer exposures, down to an eightieth of a second. Now, how many of you, let me ask you a question. Uh, see if I can see a show of hands. How many of you have seen an eclipse or photograph an eclipse on a ship before. Let's see a show of hands. A good number you have. And so you know what to expect. You know it's not going to be a perfectly still platform. 
It's not going to be like observing on land. It's you're going to have some motion. And so when you're looking through a telescope or a camera, you're going to have some motion. So what Mike Reynolds did, being the science geek I am, I went up yesterday and I decided to time trough to crest to trough in my camera. And so this is my camera. And what I noticed yesterday, yesterday was a pretty calm day, wasn't it? Towards sunset, is it takes about nine seconds, the, the entire sun was saying my field view, to go up and nine seconds to come down. So trough to crest to trough was about 18 seconds. So what I can do by using, you know, very, very um, fast bursts, raw as far as using by type of recording, I can click off images as this is going back and forth and get some really nice images, then go into Photoshop and basically square them off later. However, we also know <laughs> that we've had some little faster trough to credit. This is going to make you seasick. This is about what we've had before. I mean, it's like, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to get seasick just watching that eclipse, which probably I can see some of you turning a little green out there. But nonetheless, it's just things we need to be prepared for. Hopefully, we'll have a nice, smooth um, morning and have more of the first rather than the second. And I'm, I'm a geek enough that I know when I, you know, go up and so I don't know what to expect in advance. So, you know, again, getting some ideas, about 300 millimeter focal lengths here, just getting some ideas. Um, clouds can sometimes make nice appearances, and it's not quite as visible here for your partial phases or your angularity, which we, of course, will not see here. Now, once you get back home, it's an opportunity to do some post-eclipse um, image processing, and that's where you can add your green, your green flash, right? So, anyway. <laughs> Seriously, you can spend as much time in, in Photoshop or Registax um, doing this sort of cleanup, uh, just a cleanup on Jupiter's or Jupiter type of, you know, type of cleanup. There's a variety of things you can do there. Even going in working with the contrast, even going in and, and taking your image out will help you. Um, give you an idea of the types of things you can do in Photoshop. This is a photograph of the um, April 8, 2005 eclipse with a number of us on the, the Paul Gauguin for that eclipse. Absolutely spectacular. It was a hybrid eclipse, completely overcast. Completely overcast. And the captain found one hole, maneuvered the ship, and we saw the 30 seconds of totality. It was just spectacular. Four of us, this is a photograph taken by four different cameras, four different people. We went to the shop and stacked them. And you see a variety of ranges here, as well as Venus. And I think I pointed this out the other day when I was talking about binoculars. But just again, you can do you can do wonderful things in Photoshop. I, my challenge with Photoshop: make sure you're not overdoing it. Um, this is a photo I took of the actually it's a series of ten photos I took in um, I was leading an expedition with with, with Aram and Travel Quest again in 2001 to Chisamba. And um, I took a variety of images, and this is film. We went in and um, stacked them in Photoshop. It's kind of an eerie, surreal looking photo, but one of my favorites. I, and finally, in closing, um, a couple things I would mention. Um, I'm, again, willing to help you with your cameras. Um, just know that I don't know all cameras. I do, I'll do the best I can do, but there are some similarities. And the major caveat, not during the eclipse. Okay, glad to help you. No problem. We got plenty of time. Well, all of us are willing to help you. And, and seriously, if you have a problem during the eclipse, um, I'll be glad to try to help you as much as I can. Um, there are a variety of, of handouts. Again, Travel Quest has a nice one. The package it says I have um, my handouts are here in the back of the room, up the front, and in the back. You can grab one of those if you like to. And there are a lot of other Eclipse talks coming that you have a chance to hear more about the Eclipse and imaging and um, what to look for, those sorts of things. Never give up looking. So you heard me talk about this at our open mic the other day. Um, as I think it was Frank Marks was talking about just getting out and watching from it. It was a transit of Venus. Um, this is again 2005, completely overcast. 
and the captain swung the ship around. But my favorite story, never give up, don't quit looking, was the November 2002 eclipse. Set our equipment early in the morning, beautifully clear, this is in South Africa, and then a cloud bank rolls in, completely overcast. I thought, well, you know, maybe this is the one I'm going to miss. Shadow comes, totality begins, completely overcast. With our telescopes, so we'd set them up, and they were aligned, and we were, we were watching. 30 seconds before third contact, out comes a hole, and the eclipse sun all the way through third contact. So I'm taking photos, my son's taking video, and we're having a great old time, there's three or four of us right there. Later at evening, people seem kind of grumpy, and I said, well, what's wrong? Well, we didn't see anything. I said, we need to see anything, you're staying five feet behind me. Here's my video of the eclipse. Where, where were you? They weren't looking at giving up. Don't give up. Keep looking. You just, you, know, you, just, you just don't know when that nice little sucker hole will smile upon you and make it a chance. So don't give up. My final word of wisdom. My wife made me put this in. Is that flashing enough for you? Warning, warning, warning. Don't get stuck behind the camera during the entire totality. Don't do it. I take about every 30 seconds, about seven or eight seconds to look around, to look at the colors on the horizon, um, to look at how people appear, to look at the, how the, the, the eclipse sun looks like in the sky, what planets, stars I can see. So don't get stuck behind the camera during the entire eclipse. I, I used to spend a lot of time going down to the Kennedy Space Center shooting shuttle launches. And um, I finally learned there towards the end to not only to shoot the launch, but to also enjoy the launch. The same thing here. Just look around. Don't get stuck behind the camera the entire time. Even if you love photographing, take a gander at what's around you. you. You will not regret it. And then, believe it or not, seven seconds or so, you'll get some memories of things that you'll carry with you. So lots of eclipses coming up, but we'll talk much about that. Um, lots of eclipse um, variety of passages both lunar and solar. And with that, um, I don't have much time. I have a couple minutes for some questions. So uh, we will do that. And again, feel free to see me afterwards. I may not be able to answer all your questions. Yes, sir. Nice and loud.